Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities, supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first session of day four of the 2024 Exploring for the Future program Hi. showcase. What an amazing week we've had. My name is Marina Costello and I am the Mineral Systems Branch Head at Geoscience Australia and I'll be moderating this session titled Deep Dives into the Delamerian. I would like to begin today with an acknowledgement of country. Video. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. I acknowledge that First Nations people are the original miners, mappers and explorers of this country. And I extend a warm welcome to all First Nations Australians joining today. Yesterday, we heard about resource assessments focused on specific commodities such as hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, groundwater and minerals, which built off data sets that we heard about the day before. If you missed the session or if you'd like to access the outputs we're releasing, there are links on the showcase webpage. The work we are showcasing was not only made possible because we've got amazing people here at Geoscience Australia, but through extensive collaboration. We sincerely thank all of our collaborators and if you're online, g'day everyone, for your valuable contributions from planning, data acquisition, land access, scientific collaboration on publications. We are so very grateful to you. Today, we are zooming into the regional projects 
focused first on minerals, then energy, and finally this afternoon, groundwater. We'll start with a deep dive into the Delamarian origin, a region that extends across the borders of New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. We'll hear about the overall architecture of this covered region, isotopic mapping to reveal its geological history and consideration of its mineral potential. There will be a Q&A session following the presentation, so please ask questions of the presenters by using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. The speakers are presenting on behalf of large teams, amazing teams, hardworking experts that include many scientists, administrators and other professionals. So if they can't answer your question today, they will be happy to take it on notice via our email eftf at ga.gov.au. Our first speaker is Chris Lewis, who will present on Scaffold to Success, an overview of the Delamarian origin and its crustal and lithospheric architecture. As Director of Regional Geology and Drilling, Chris provides strategic science leadership and coordination to deliver regional scale drilling and mineral potential projects, collaborates with government, industry and academia, and leads a team of high performing scientists and technical experts. Thank you, Chris. For the last 500 million years, the subduction zone that gave rise to the Delamarian origin has continued its eastward retreat. Today's Tonga Kermadec subduction zone, representing the boundary between the Australian and Pacific tectonic plates, started its existence in a period called the Cambrian as the Delamarian margin. Through hundreds of millions of years, a cycle of initiation, cessation and reinitiation, the subduction zone progressively built the Australian continent as we see it today. This reinitiation of subduction over time resulted in the ever increasing distal extensional and contractional events associated with the building of the Australian tectonic plate continuing to have an influence over the Delamarian origin. Stretching more than 2,000 kilometres long and 300 kilometres wide, the known extent of rocks deformed by the Delamarian orogeny, a Cambrian mountain building event, span parts of South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. The geographic extent of these deformed rocks is called the Delamarian origin. The Delamarian origin represents the first part of the Tasmanides and the transition of pre-Cambrian Australia to Phanerozoic Australia it separates the Proterozoic rocks that host deposits like Olympic Dam and Broken Hill from the Yonga rocks of the Tasmanides that host world-class copper and gold deposits like Bendigo, Cobar and Cadia. However, the Delamarian origin is less well understood than either the Proterozoic rocks or the rocks of the Eastern Tasmanides. To be able to answer the question, can new pre-competitive geoscience aid in discovery of Delamarian hosted deposits, it's important to understand the tectonic history of the Delamarian origin because it is the crustal architecture of the origin that provides the scaffolding to which mineral systems form. Later in this series, Dr. Yambo Cheng will speak to these mineral systems in more detail. The Delamarian origin started to form during a phase of continental breakup that eventually evolved into a passive margin setting around 850 to 515 million years ago. Although generally well established in the south, there remains some debate as to how far north into what is now Queensland, this passive margin extended. As the passive margin evolved, deep marine turbididic and pelagic sediments, represented here in the yellow, were deposited in parts of what is now South Australia and New South Wales. This was accompanied by magmatism associated with the Mount Arrowsmith volcanics in northern New South Wales and tholeitic to morb type magmatism in Victoria. At around 515 to 505 million years ago, a westward dipping subduction margin had developed on the eastern edge of what is now the Delamarian origin. This was accompanied by arc to island arc magmatism in both northern New South Wales and western Victoria. During this period, it is interpreted that the subducting slab comprised of oceanic crust and lithospheric mantle began to roll back, leading to the retreat of the arc and subsequent back arc extension. In the back arc setting, shown here in light blue, marine sedimentary rocks were deposited. These were accompanied by tholeitic magmatism. Closer to the subduction zone, arc-related magmatism, shown in red, and generally of calc alkaline chemistries, were emplaced or erupted. Finally, on the eastern margin of the now Delamarian origin, T 
turbididic sediments were deposited into a four arc setting, shown in green. In northern New South Wales, these turbidite sequences were also accompanied by tholeitic magnetism. Between 505 and 495 million years ago, orogenesis occurred, culminating in the Delamarian orogeny. At this point in time, the subduction zone had migrated farther eastward, and the Delamarian origin would not see any significant tectonism for another 70 million years. At the end of the Delamarian orogeny, magmatism resulted in the emplacement of post-orogenic granitoids in the South Australian portion of the Delamarian origin. There was also the deposition of the fluvial to shallow marine Mutawinji and K. Runnera groups in northwestern New South Wales. The next major phase of crustal formation would not occur until the Silurian and Devonian around 420 million years ago. In the next talk in this session by Dr. David Moll, we will dive deeper into the new geochronology data from the Delamarian origin acquired under the Exploring for the Future program. Many of these regions where the Delamarian origin crops out, such as the Coonanbury Belt or southern end of the Grampian Staveley Zone, are relatively well studied, contain significant mineralisation and have seen widespread mineral exploration. In contrast, the basement geology and mineral potential of the broad region between the Coonanbury Belt and Grampian Staveley Zone is less well understood and has seen significantly less exploration activity. The continuous nature of the Cambrian volcanic arc of the Coonanbury and Grampian Staveley Zone was first proposed in the late 1990s. But due to the continuous cover obscuring the Delamarian origin and paucity of basement intersecting drill holes, this remains largely untested until now. We now know there are significant areas where cover thins to about 100 to 200 metres, such as in the Loch Lily Cars Belt. If these covered regions can be shown to host similar rocks to those of other prospective parts of the Delamarian origin, then they could represent a significant exploration opportunity. We will be discussing the nature of the crustal architecture of the Delamarian origin as it's seen today. In the next talk, David Moll will speak to the evolution of the Delamarian origin through time, providing an insight into the timing and isotopic nature of the origin. To unravel the complexity of the crustal architecture, we employed the use of broadband magnetotellurics to image the electrical resistivity structures at depth, deep crustal reflection seismic to investigate the geological units in the deep subsurface, airborne electromagnetics to evaluate landscape and shallow resistivity features to aid in assessing cover depths, stratigraphic drilling to test the models developed through the geophysics and sample the subsurface rocks, and finally geochemical characterisation to inform our tectonic models. The new resistivity model generated from magnetotelluric data confirms and better resolves the crustal scale features mapped by OSLAMP. The new model reveals several conductive features beneath the Kernamona province. Of interest are the apparent continuous arcuate conductors in the mid to lower crust at about 40 kilometres depth. In the west, these conductors coincide with the main structural grains of the Delamarian origin, being interpreted as ancient fluid pathways associated with major faults. However, in the east, the conductor cross-cuts the main structural grain. This conductor coincides with the southern edge of the Coonanbury Belt at the Grassmere Knee Zone, a region where there is a marked change in the structural grain from north-northwest, south-southeast in the north to northeast, southwest in the south. It has been documented that mid-crustal conductive features can be associated with gold mineralisation. However, the true nature of this Delamarian origin conductor remains enigmatic. Looking at shallower conductive features at around 10 kilometres, the conductivity models of magnetotelluric data show a subtle north-south trending anomaly that may be interpreted as Cambrian volcanic arc rocks. However, it remains difficult to resolve these features from the overlying conductive sedimentary basins. And so we look to other geophysical techniques to help in our interpretation of if a Cambrian volcanic arc continues beneath cover. The acquisition of deep crustal reflection seismic data is able to provide first order controls on the crustal architecture, image the distribution of geological units in the deep subsurface, and provide estimates of cover depth. To aid us in testing of the continuation of the Cambrian volcanic arc, we acquired more than 1,200 kilometres of deep crustal reflection seismic data over the Delamarian origin. For this talk, we are focusing on line 22 GACD2 which images the central eastern Delamarian origin where basement rocks are concealed beneath the Murray Basin. The migrated 18 second two-way time display of the uninterpreted data shows reasonably clear reflection features in the northeast and generally up to four seconds, but becomes more complex in the central and southwest. 
Here we can see the development of sedimentary basins that dip towards the southwest. Although challenging in places, the interpretation of the deep seismic reflection line has allowed for the mapping of key faults and packages of reflectors of similar character. In the final interpretation of this line, we see that there has been a lot of post-Devonian motion that has brought up many of the older rocks closer to surface. Of particular note is the relatively shallow cover depths over Cambrian-aged arc rocks located within the Lake Wintlow belt. A potential extension to the Grampian Staveley belt to the south and the Coonanbury belt to the north. If there was sufficient Devonian aged cover over these Cambrian rocks, it may be possible that the Cambrian arc is still preserved. But to test this, we need to sample the rocks through drilling. The Delamarian origin is covered by younger sediments of the Murray Basin. The Murray Basin itself is important for a range of uses, including agriculture, management of groundwater and groundwater dependent ecosystems, as a source of water for industry, and having clay hosted rare earth element and heavy mineral sand deposits. However, that's a story for another day. We made use of airborne electromagnetic or AEM data to better estimate the depth of basement across the area. These data allow for scattered depth to basement observations to be integrated into a more coherent model. And the undercover geological mapping beneath shallow cover allowing for the identification of conductive and resistive basement packages. For example, through the use of AEM data, our teams have been able to map the continuation of prospective Canman 2 group and stall zone geology beneath cover, allowing industry to hunt for known mineral system host rocks in previously underexplored areas. One of the key challenges in understanding and realising the mineral potential in the Delamarian origin is figuring out the geology of the region between the outcropping and comparatively well studied and explored Coonanbury Belt in New South Wales and Staveley Zone in Victoria. The intervening rocks are mostly buried and largely underexplored, but are within 200 metres of the surface across most of the 250 kilometre long region known as the Loch Lily Cars Belt. To de-risk greenfield mineral exploration in this frontier region, Geoscience Australia in partnership with the MINEX CRC's National Drilling Initiative and Geological Survey of New South Wales undertook a regional stratigraphic drilling campaign across the southern end of the Loch Lily Cars Belt in western New South Wales. New analytical data collected from these drill holes has been combined with new data obtained from numerous legacy boreholes in the region. Together, these data sets represent a step change in the level of baseline geological data in the region. In addition, they complement the Geological Survey of South Australia's drilling and analysis program across the border in South Australia, which is also being run in partnership with the MINEX CRC. The primary aims of our drilling campaign were to understand and constrain the geology of the southern Loch Lily Cars Belt and assess whether Cambrian magmatic rocks continued to the southwest in the Lake Wintlow Belt, marking a possible continuation of the Staveley volcanic arc rocks observed in western Victoria. Through the use of a combination of conventional drilling and cold tubing technologies, 17 boreholes totaling more than five kilometres were completed in the first half of 2023. In two of these holes, we intersected igneous rocks with porphyritic rhyodacites and granodiorite, the former being emplaced at a higher volcanic to subvolcanic level, potentially indicating we've intersected just the very top of the volcanic arc. Geochemically, the porphyritic rhyodacite showed calc alkaline affinities similar to known porphyry copper deposits farther south in Western Victoria. The unprecedented amount of new data in this region has allowed for the reinterpretation of geophysical data sets to produce a new solid geology basement map of the Loch Lily Cars belt and surrounding rocks. This product allows explorers to quickly understand the distribution, age and character of different rocks, thereby allowing them to assess their prospectivity for different mineral systems. A key output of this work is the recognition and mapping of the significant extent of Cambrian and younger magmatic rocks that appear to be sourced from subduction modified mantle. Combining the better understanding of the regional geology with new and legacy whole rock geochemical data, we've been able to characterise the intermediate to mafic rocks within the Loch Lily Cars Belt. The Loch Lily Cars Belt contains a significant amount of Cambrian magmatic rocks that have subduction like geochemistry. For example, negative niobium, tantalum and titanium anomalies. These are broadly similar to the characteristics of other arc-like rocks in the Delamarian origin, for example, within the Staveley belt. Integrating the geochemistry with new geochronological data, we can observe the arc-like magmatism shown here in red young southwards from around 510 million years to around 500 million years. This was coincident with more back arc-like magmatism shown in blue 
developing in the Loch Lee Cars Belt. This suggests that the Loch Lee Cars Belt developed as an arc at 510 million years ago, before developing into a back arc position between 510 and 500 million years ago, just prior to or during the Delamere and Orogeny. This fits well with data from the Geological Survey of South Australia's Delamarian Drilling Campaign, an analysis program that indicates that much of the Delamarian origin in South Australia developed within a broad back arc setting, west of the 505 million year old Staveley Arc in Western Victoria. The new geological and geophysical data presented here, together with previously published works, is best explained by a single east-facing convergent margin developed in what is now the Delamarian origin of the Australian mainland between 515 and 500 million years ago. In addition to presenting a mostly continuous volcanic arc and fore arc, our interpretation also highlights a southward broadening back arc, consistent with previous models and new isotopic data, with an arc magmatism transition from more continental affinity in the Coonanbarri and Loch Lee Cars belts to less continental, more oceanic affinity in the Granby and Staveley zone. The identification and mapping of features of this Cambrian convergent margin provides a refined exploration framework for related mineral systems, as subsequent talks in this series will show. So in summary, by expanding on the work of others, we have refined and filled in the gaps in our understanding of the evolution of the Delamarian origin. Through the development of a consistent geological framework, we've been able to confirm the location of a buried belt of volcanic rocks, evidence the contiguous nature of these Cambrian Age rocks between the Coonanbarri Belt and Grampian Staveley Zone, showing these rocks to have the potential to hold porphyry copper systems, and that these systems are at explorable depths of only up to a few hundred metres. So far in this talk, we have only looked at the relatively narrow part of the Delamarian origin. But what can we learn about the lateral variations of the origin and their mineral potential? To answer that question, you will need to stick around for the talks by Dr. David Mole and Dr. Yambo Cheng. Ah, thanks, Chris. What a great overview of the Delamarian. The wealth and awesomeness of new geophysical imaging and geological constraints on the Delamarian or origin collected by the program has constrained the distribution of significant rocks buried undercover. Go and check this out. Dr. David Mole will now present, only time will tell, crustal development of the Delamarian origin in space and time. David joined Geoscience Australia in 2021 as an in-house geochronologist and isotope geochemist. Prior to this, he completed his PhD at the University of Western Australia and postdoctoral research at Curtin University, CSRO and Laurentian University in Canada. G'day to all the Canadians logging in. David's work has focused on using isotopic data to map the evolution of continents and its role in the formation of multiple mineral systems. Thanks, David. Thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone for coming along. Today I'm going to talk about this mineral, zircon. It's only 350 microns in size, but it can tell us about some of the biggest features on Earth, continents, mountain chains and subduction zones, for example. These zircon grains contain unique isotopic and geochemical information which can inform us of the development of Earth's crust and ultimately its mineral fertility. In this talk, I'll be using uranium-led geochronology Hafnium oxygen isotopes and trace amounts from zircon to map the evolution of the Delamarian origin, its changing architecture, and its associated mineral prospectivity. These isotopic systems are reliant on the passage of geological time to create the unique signatures we measure, making crustal evolution genuinely a story only time will tell. So, when we started the project, we had a few major questions around the Delamarian origin. The first was what is the spatial extent of the origin? Is the Delamarian arc a continuous or non continuous belt? What is likely is the search space from a mineral systems perspective? What's the time space evolution of the belt? How did the origin develop over time? What were the crystal sources involved and what ultimately was their mineral fertility? And can we map the spatial extent of those crystal sources? And ultimately, how does this all come together to impact the time space mineral potential? And we want to define a search space and really help understand exploration risks, which ultimately feeds into exploration targeting. So th let's talk a little bit about the temporal evolution of Delamarian origin very briefly. There were four main phases to the origin itself. The first phase was a rift or passive margin phase at 830 to 515 MA. And then we move into the magmatic arc phase to the Delamarian arc at 515 to 495 MA. 
then the Danimerian origin itself at about 500 million years ago, into the post orogenic phase of 495 to 460, which is actually almost twice as long as the arc phase. And then there was a hiatus of around 40 million years before we move into the Siloan Devonian magnetism at about 420. And this essentially reactivates the Delamarian margin at that time. So when we're doing the geochronology, we had a few aims of what we wanted to achieve, and they all feed back into those questions we had at the beginning. So we wanted to build on and test the current framework we see here. We wanted to further constrain the extent of the Delamarian arc rocks, especially at the eastern margin of the origin. We want to reduce the data gaps. Ultimately, we can see this is the map of the compiled zircon uranium lead dates. We can see we have a pretty significant gap in the central area here. We really want to help fill that. We want to assess the continuity of the arc. Does it really form along the entire length of the origin? And does it assess, can we assess, sorry, the extent of the 420 MA magnetism that happens at the end of the, the period I showed earlier? Ultimately, we want to better define the search space for Cambrian arc rocks using all this information put together from the geochronology. So to do that, we took a multifaceted approach. First of all, we did a data compilation. This was performed by Simon Badorkus and Sharon Jones in Geochronology and Stigraphy. And this gave us that pre-existing data set that we could base our, our data collection on. We then did some redating of legacy samples to prepare a data set for the isotopic survey that I'm going to talk about in the later slides. And we also did geochronology on new samples, which were mainly from legacy drill holes, and they're shown in the blue stars here. So ourselves and Geological Survey of South Australia performed drilling with the National Drilling Initiative, and GSSA performed 11 new samples of geochronology done by Liz Jagodinsky, and there were eight samples done by myself here at Geoscience Australia. And they're shown in the, in the larger stars on the map. We also collected data around the origin so we could understand the extent of the Cambrian rocks, but also how the crustal sources interacted with younger magnetism. And in total, we collected 134 new shrimp UPB zircon ages, and all those were collected at GA on our in-house eye microprobe. The result of this was a large new geochronology data set with an emphasis on undercover geology. So we take those results and plot them on the time-space plot here. We can see this is the result. The blue stars are GA, EFTF, new igneous samples. The light blue are our drilling samples, and the orange are Geological Survey of South Australia samples. We can plot that data on a map, and we've segregated the different samples here by time. And the main thing I want to draw your attention to is the continuous belt of red dots, which demonstrate the arc-related rocks. We can see that in purple are the post-orogenic samples, and they're con constrained to the southern part of the origin. And the light blue around the Kernamona crater, craton or the 420 magnetism. So we're already starting to see some spatial um, concentration of samples in different ages with a new data set. So if we go back to our original questions that we asked in the previous slide, have we built on and tested the current framework? I think we have and we've demonstrated the current framework is, is solid. If anything, we've demonstrated that the post-orogenic phase is actually a lot longer than we thought before, and that reinforces work done by Wei Hong in South Australia. We can also see that we've, we wanted to further constrain the extent of Delamarian arc rocks, and importantly, if we look at these samples here shown by the red ellipse, they've demonstrated that we do have arc rocks further to the east at the edge of the Delamarian origin on that eastern margin. We also want to reduce the data gaps particularly around the central Delamarian origin. And in this area here, we now have 29 new samples, which has really helped us understand this area. And most of this, pretty much all of it, is under cover of the Moray Basin. We also wanted to map out the boundary of the, of the origin here. I think the samples we've collected show that this is pro approximately the boundary of the Cambrian arc rocks. We also want to look at the continuity of the arc, and again, the new magmatic arc samples that are between 515 and 495, especially in that central area, demonstrate that the arc was most likely continuous, and this, of course, increases the, our understanding of the search space for Cambrian magmatic arc rocks and related mineral systems. If anybody's interested in knowing more about our ages from our drilling, this is a, a link to that report. So we wanted, the geochronology was really important, and we really wanted to take it to another level. So what we did was perform half-demoxion isotopes on those same zircons that we dated. 
and that helps give us information on the age and nature of the crustal source through time. And we also did trace elements on those zircons to help us understand magma fertility as well as petrogenesis of the magmas themselves. So that new zircon data set is supplied to multiple projects. So we've collected 87 new samples for the Dale and Marion origin and the DCD project, which is what I'm going to talk about mainly in this presentation. We also collected 147 new samples for the Aristopic Atlas of Australia, which Jeff Fraser talked about earlier this week. And that was concentrated on Southeast Australia. So talking a little bit more about the latter, we can plot a map of the crustal architecture of Southeast Australia. This map shows Hafnian model age, which essentially tells you when the crust was extracted from the mantle. The orange and yellow colours are younger crust, more juvenile crust, and the blue to purple colours are older crust. We can see what we've done here, we've essentially mapped the edge of the South Australian craton. And this is essentially the craton margin of essentially cratonic Australia. And the eastern margin of the cratonic area is probably very favourable for mineral systems because we know that craton margins are an important focus of magmas and fluids, especially for systems like nickel and sediment host of copper. The Denimarian origin sits right at this, at this margin too, which means it's in the favourable position. And magmatic ages and isotopic data also generally show this oroclinal trend we can see in the map and in the uranium lead ages themselves. Younger, more juvenile crust is inferred in the Delamere and Backhart region, as we can see right on the edge of the South Australian craton there. And we can also essentially map out the zonation of the crust using the UPB, but also the Hafnium isotopes, and that allows us to identify things like the Backhart. But we can also see, as I said before, the zonation in the ages, so more post orogenic magmatism in the South Delamerian and more 420 magmatism in the North Delamerian. So how do these factors ultimately impact time-space mineral potential? Craton margins are an important focus for mineral systems, as I said before, but also this map is, is useful because we can look at individual areas and pull out intricacies and detail in the crust, which may be important for localising those mineral systems. So before I move on to the rest of the talk, it's important to understand the link between zircon chemistry and mineral systems. In intrusion-related systems, previous work has shown that there's a correlation between a mineral system itself magma fractionation and oxidation state, and that's demonstrated and summarised in this diagram here. Broadly speaking, oxidised primitive magmas form copper and copper moly deposits, and reduced fractionated systems produce tin, tungsten, moly systems. And these parameters can essentially be correlated with the epsilon hafnium, the oxygen isotopes, and the delta FMQ, which is an oxidation state parameter. So what we can see is more primitive magmas have higher epsilon hafnium and lower tal 18 -0. The more oxidized magmas have clearly higher oxidin, oxidation state, sorry, but also a lower del 18 -0. Hence, we can make important associations between the zircon petrochronology, which we're going to talk about in the later slides, and the actual mineral system. And a good example would be the Macquarie Arc, where we see high epsilon hafnium and high del 18 -0, which would plot in the upper right of this diagram, which is where the copper sits, which is what we'd expect. BHMS systems are more likely to be related to the hafnium oxygen trace and system acts with copper systems, but we're going to mainly focus on the intrusion related systems in this presentation. So moving on, we're going to start off looking at the temporal evolution of the Delamerian origin. So we've got three plots here. We have a hafnium, oxygen and oxidation state plot in delta FMQ, and we also have a map showing the location of the samples in the plots um, separated by the different colours of the different belts they're from. Just to give you a little bit of a rundown of how each system works, in epsilon hafnium, everything above zero is essentially mantle derived. Everything below zero is essentially crustally derived or old crust. In the oxygen, everything above the mantle field has a, essentially a sedimentary component. Everything below the mantle field has a hydrothermal component or high temperature hydrothermal component. And in the oxidation state plot, the delta FMQ zircon plot, everything above zero is oxidized. Everything below zero is more reduced. But really, we need to be above one to be really in the quite strongly oxidized field. So we're going to go through phase by phase. We'll start off with the arc phase. What we can see here is that the majority of Delamerian arc mammas have an old crustal component, only stably really is consistently juvenile. The del 18 mirrors this pattern we see in the hafnium, and there's a trend of increasing oxidation over the life of the arc, as we see in the bottom plot. Particularly stably is, is quite highly oxidized relative to the other belts. If we look at the post orogenic phase, we can see that magmatism is essentially bimodal in epsilon hafnium space, and then the del 18 really mirrors this. But the oxidation state is quite interesting that all the magmas seem to be primarily oxidized. Moving to the Salon Devonian phase, there's this the hiatus that I talked about previously, 
between 460 and 425 MA. So most of the magnetism is happening around 420. Again, there seems to be two clear groups. The brown samples show that they're relatively juvenile, they're relatively mantle-like in the oxygen area, and the oxidation state is generally oxidized, particularly in a lot of the cars. So we can take this data and we can look at it more directly for, in terms of fertility. So we can use trace element pro proxies such as those shown in the slide here for hydration and for oxidation. We can combine them with the parameters we've been using, the isotopic parameters. And using the relationships we talked about previously with mineral systems, we can look at magma fertility. So these plots show all of the trace element data and the isotopic data. Red shows the arc rocks. Purple shows the post orogenic rocks, and blue shows the Sloan Devonian magnetism. If we take copper, for instance, we know it likes juvenile ha hafnium, mantle like DAD18O, oxidized, and hydrous magmas. Those magmas were plot in this field. And for tin tungsten systems, they prefer reworked epsilon hafnium, high DAD18O, reduced, and dry magmas, and they plot in this field. So this is really an example of how we can use these plots and these, this data set to look how fertility changes through time. So now we're going to move on to the spatial evolution of the origin. We're going to start off in the arc phase here at 515 to 495. So if we look at the epsilon hafnium first, the orange and yellow colors represent more juvenile crust, more mantle-derived crust, and the blue and purples represent older crust. You can see that there's a variable crustal architecture along the length of the origin. In Coonanbury, we see older crust, in Lotley Cars, slightly younger. In Aluruna, in the central area, older again, and then much younger and juvenile in the Staveley area. And in Tasmania, we tend to see, we see this, what looks like a, a margin between juvenile and reworked crust. The oxygen essentially mirrors this. Again, Staveley clearly stands out as being more mantle derived. And in the oxidation state, we can see that most of the belt is reduced or very slightly oxidized. And Staveley stands out again as being the most oxidized area. So moving on to the post orogenic phase, in the Hafnium plot we can see two main areas. In the western side of the origin we have a more juvenile region, and to the south around Glen Elg zone it is more reworked. The oxygen essentially mirrors this, but we do see that the entire area is almost predominantly oxidized. So these mangroves are particularly oxidized it seems. So moving on to the final period, in terms of spatial evolution, looking at the 420 MA magnetism. Instead of seeing that north-south control we saw before, we're seeing an east-west control now, with more juvenile crust to the west and more reworked crust to the east. We can also see here that the mineral systems, as dated by Yambo, who's going to be speaking next, correlate nicely with the more juvenile area. In the oxygen isotopes, we can see the same kind of pattern, more supercrustal like or crustal oxygen to the east, more mantle like to the west. And in the oxidation state, we see that pattern preserved, more oxidized to the west. So have we answered the questions we asked at the beginning of the presentation? What is the spatial extent of Delamere and arc rocks? What is the time space evolution of the belt, the associated crustal sources, and ultimately the mineral fertility of the area? Well, we can answer the first question from the geochronology. The Delamere arc was continuous along the belt, we think, and ultimately, Cambrian alt rocks do exist in that central eastern Delamarian under the Murray Basin, and this is really important because it does potentially increase the search space for Cambrian arc related magmatic rocks in terms of their mineral fertility and mineral systems. We can answer the second question by combining all the different isotopic systems we've looked at to produce maps like this, which combine the hafnium data, the oxygen data as point data, and then a color bar to understand oxidation state. If we then go through each time period, we can understand what the spatial prospectivity may be. So in that first arc phase, it's dominate, the belt is dominated by old, mildly oxidized crust with a high supercrustal component, and from Staveley, which consists of young oxidized crust with a high temperature component. And based on our understanding of the mineral systems from the previous slide, we can say that these areas will be more copper perspective, and these areas will be more tin tungsten perspective. So this helps us turn this map into something like a fertility map. If we then move on to the post orogenic phase, we identify these two zones, which the northern zone is more mantle-like and the southern zone is essentially more reworked crust. And that would mean that we have copper prospectivity here and tin tungsten prospecti prospectivity in these areas. So in the final Solar and Devonian phase, 
we again identified these two areas, an eastern and western area, with the western area being essentially more mantle-like, and that means that we expect to see more copper systems in the western area, more tin tungsten in the eastern area. Together, this new knowledge can be used to inform area selection and ultimately define mineral system-specific search bases, reducing exploration risk and hopefully expanding our ability to target in exploration more effectively. Thank you very much and a big thank you to all of our collaborators and partners over the life of the project. David, adding a temporal and geochemical dimension to what Chris presented is super informative for our understanding of the region's resource potential, that 4D lens, that aspect is really important. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Yambo Cheng. Well, on, what's the big deal? It's a big deal. Don't, don't change channels. New mineral potential insights of the Delamerian origin. As senior mineral systems geoscientist, Yambo led the regional scale deep dive mineral system study and mineral potential assessment of the Delamerian origin under the Exploring for the Future program. Yambo completed his PhD in economic geology at James Cook University and had several international roles in government, industry and university organisations before joining Geoscience Australia in early 2022. Thank you, Yambo. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome to the last talk of this session. Is it a big deal? I believe everyone in front of your screen want to know the answer. Same for us. Let's find it out in the next 20 minutes. In this talk, I'm going to show our new data on the mineral systems in the Delamarine origin and our new insights of their mineral and economic potential. From the talks given by Chris and David, we now know that the Delamarine origin is a continuous convergent margin extending from New South Wales and South Australia to Western Victoria on mainland Australia. The Delamarine origin recorded over 400 million years of geological history, during which it experienced a range of evolutionary stages and tectonic settings, including passive margin, rifting, arc-related subduction, collision, and orogeny, and post-orogenic extension. You may ask, why is the detailed understandings of the tectonic evolution of the Dalamari so important? The reason is that such convergent margins are best viewed as tectonometallogenic systems, which means the tectonic evolution and the formation of mineral systems are interlinked. Therefore, a good understanding of the tectonometallogenic system allows us to predict the potential of certain types of mineral systems. An example of such a relationship is shown on the figure on the right, displaying the global locations of large to supergiant porphyry copper systems and deposits. It is very clear that they are located in current and paleomagmatic arcs. As a convergent margin, the Delamarine is a favorite tectonic environment for several mineral systems, such as porphyry, epistemal, and scarn. As an example, the figure on the right illustrates different types of volcanic-hosted massive sulfide systems can form in this environment. I would like to briefly touch on some of the open questions regarding the mineral systems in Delamarine before we started our work. The Delamarine is known to host a range of mineralization styles, and there has been some excellent work done on selected deposits. However, for a lot of the deposits, the age of mineralization, their deposit types and pyrogenesis were not well constrained, which made it difficult to assess their mineral potential in a regional geological context. To address these problems, we conducted the first comprehensive study on the mineral systems in the Delamarine margin on mainland Australia, with the aim to address two questions. What is the mineral potential in the Delamarine origin margin? And if there is some potential, is it a big deal? We have applied a range of techniques to reduce mineral potential assessment uncertainties. For example, we have systematically collected geochronology, mineral chemistry, 
and the software stops of the key mineral prospects and deposits in the project area. To understand the mineral potential in the Dalamarian origin, it is fundamental to characterize the mineral systems, particularly their metallogenic characteristics, which is one of the key research outcomes from this project. The first set of samples are from the legacy drill core samples of 51 drill holes. We collected high-resolution drill core scan files, microscopic images, and manual liberation analysis maps to study their textures, manual assemblages, and pyrogenic sequences of the mineralized rocks. These data are directly from the rocks associated with mineralization. Therefore, they can provide direct information to help mineral exploration in the region. We have also studied the 17 new drill holes from the New South Wales NDI Dalamarine Margin Drilling Program. As shown by the photos on the right, we have found magmatic rocks of mafic, intermediate, and felsic in comparison. Different types of magmatic hydrothermal alteration styles, hydrothermal fractures, hydrothermal veins with symmetric salvages, and sulfides. These metallogenic characteristics have shown similarities with rocks from the Stevely drilling program and the South Australia NDI Delamarine origin drilling program. Earlier in this session, David has showed us the, la the late Cambrian age from the new NDI drill holes in New South Wales. The new ages are consistent with the results from our drilling programs in the Dalamarine origin. Put all of this information together, the Dalamarine origin sounds like a juicy environment for forming a series of mineral systems. In this project, we characterized 22 key mineral prospects and deposits. The table on the right summarizes some of the key information, including the name of the prospects and deposits, the commodities contained in these systems, and the types of mineral systems they belong to. All this information are recorded in the report shown in the middle of the slide, which has been released and publicly accessible. I mark the different types of mineral systems in different colors and plot them on the map of the Dalamarian origin margin to demonstrate their spatial distributions. In the next, I will step through the metallogenic evolution through time in the context of tectonic evolution stages of the Dalamarian convergent margin, from old to young. The mafic ultramafic rocks and nickel copper PGE systems are found in the Mount Aerosmith area of northern Cunnamary Belt, New South Wales. We have successfully obtained two ages from appetite using uranium light isotope systems. The ages are between 590 million years and 580 million years. The nickel, copper, and PGE mineralization is primarily associated with basaltic rocks. We have outlined the distribution of basaltic rocks package in this region. They can give indications to explorers about where to look for this mineral system. Nickel, copper, and PGEs are listed critical minerals and strategic resources in Australia. Most of the critical minerals are byproducts for different mineral systems. So it is important to conduct nanoscale analysis to reveal their content, distribution, and deportment. For example, Apart from the nickel sulfides, pentlandite, nickel can also be enriched on the rim of pyrite in the Mount Aerosmith area, as shown by the mineral chemistry map. Integrated with existing understandings, the Mount Aerosmith mafic ultramafic nickel copper PGE system is believed to form in a rift related passive continent margin setting. During the breakup of the Rodinia supercontinent in the new Prot Rock, Moving now into the Cambrian, we applied multiple analytical methods and techniques to constrain the timing of mineralization by using hydrothermal alteration minerals, which are directly linked to the formation of sulfides. We received a group of ages between 505 million years and 494 million years from the porphyry epithermal mineral systems in both the localized cars of New South Wales and the Stavely room of Victoria, and one age around 525 million years in South Australia. The 515 million years to 490 million years was a key interval for the development of a magmatic arc system in Dalamarine. 
This marks a major regional metallogenic event, facilitating a range of mineral systems, including porphyry, epithermal, scarn, and VMS mineral systems. We outlined the extent of the convergent margin in green color based on Geoscience Australia's layered geological mapping, plus the distribution of the arc rocks on the map in yellow. The arc rocks can be juicy for a series of magmatic hydrothermal mineral systems. We have confirmed multiple commodities, including critical minerals and strategic resources in the Cambrian mineral systems. Copper, gold, and zinc are the primary base metals. And we have also revealed the occurrences of several critical minerals, such as cobalt and indium in sulfide minerals. Sulfur stops can be useful to study the source of all materials. The photo on the left shows sulfur stop composition of nanoscale uh, pyrite with different textures from the Scrops Ranch prospect of Lady cars biot in New South Wales. The sulfur stop value of the pyrite with clean surface are lower than the values of the rough surface. But overall, all the values are between zero and four per mil, which means that there are multiple generations of magmatic sulfur involved in the formation of the sulfide. Therefore, it is likely that several genera generations of magmatic fluids are involved in the formation of sulfide in the Scrobs Ranch prospect, which can enhance the mineral potential of the system in the region. The formation of these Cambrian mineral systems are controlled by the evolution of the Delamarian arc in the context of a continuous convergent margin setting. This means a series of geological processes, including subduction, magma generation, fractionation, redox variation, and fluid exclusion and evolution. These processes can eventually lead to the formation of a spectrum of mineral systems like what has been outlined here. The 490 million years to 460 million years granitic magmatism and the related porphyry copper moly mineralization have been well studied by a MINAC CRC embedded researcher, Dr. Wei Hong, in collaboration with Geologic Survey of South Australia and the University of Adelaide. To help explorers narrow down the search space for the Ordovician porphyry copper moly systems, we have outlined the distribution of the magmatic rocks formed between 495 million years and 460 million years, based on the latest layered geological mapping by Geoscience Australia experts. The model proposed by Hong et al. suggests the magmatism and the porphyry copper moly deposits formation is a far field response to subduction related to the Macquarie Arc. More details can be, can be found in their publications. The originic gold system have been found in the east of Cambrian Volcanic Arc and the north of Cunnenbury Belt, as well as the central stalwart room in Victoria. They are formed in the early Silurian, around 440 million years. The formation of the uh, orogenic gold system is associated with the green schist to amphibole phases, metamorphism of turbidite sequences, and the activation of regional scale fault systems during the Benambrian origin. The orogenic gold deposits have a very interesting fluid history. Here I show you an example of sulfur stops composition of pyrite from the Fiddler's Creek of Central Stalwarum, which demonstrates multiple sources of fluid contributed to the formation of sulfides in the organic gold system. The sulfur stop variations are consistent with its textures and chemical compositional variations. The mineral chemistry map highlights the variations of cobalt content in this pyrite sample. The rim of the pyrite has a clean surface with lower delta sulfur 34 values and contains higher cobalt, while the core of the pyrite, which has a rough surface and higher delta sulfur 34 values, contains lower cobalt. This indicates different fluids have distinct capacity to enrich and transport different metals. This understanding is particularly important for Creek minerals. The last metallogenic event is discovered in Devonian. 
we have obtained a group of magmatic hydrothermal ages between 412 million years and 399 million years. The samples are from several types of mineral systems, including porphyry, epithermal, and insulin-related gold. This is a newly discovered metallogenic event in the Delamarine origin margin, and more work is required to further our understandings. The timing of mineral radiation might be taken to suggest a link to the Devonian Basin formation and regional extension. The map on the right shows the distribution of Silurian to Devonian magmatic rocks along the eastern margin of the Delamarine origin. These rocks are formed between 420 million years old and around 400 million years, and are widely distributed in the New South Wales, South Australia, and Western Victoria. The maps on the right shows the distribution of Silurian to Devonian magmatic rocks along the eastern margin of the Delamarine origin. These rocks are formed between 420 million years and around 400 million years, and are widely distributed in New South Wales and Western Victoria. They might be responsible for the formation of these Devonian magmatic hydrothermal mineral systems. Mineral chemistry of sulfides from these Devonian mineral systems are collected to understand the potential of creek minerals. Based on our new data, the commodities are copper, gold, zinc, silver, cobalt, indium, arsenic, bismuth, and tellurium. This concludes the metallogenic evolution through time in the Delamarine origin margin. If we now step back and put everything together, we can start to address the two questions raised in the beginning of this talk. By showing the spatial extent of magmatic rocks from different time intervals in the history of the Delamarine origin, we demonstrate areas of interest or potential for multiple mineral systems within the relevant geological sequences and cover. This shows the five types of mineral systems and their commodities, including critical minerals and strategic resources, spread across five different metallogenic events across the Delamarine origin margin. Based on what we have found in this project, we have also developed a toolkit for explorers to identify mineral systems in the Delamarine. This includes a package of minerals and rocks for each deposit type. By using this toolkit, explorers can know what they potentially are dealing with in the field. This information is important for exploration in the Delamarine origin because it is a mostly covered terrain and a relatively data poor, which has a big impact on assessing its mineral as well as economic potential. As a covered terrain, the depths to the basement has a big impact on the economic viability of mineral discoveries. My colleagues at Geoscience Australia are developing a new cover model for the region, and the models have been tested with drilling by Minex CRC through the Delamarine Margin NDI programs, which can significantly reduce risks for explorers. Now to my second question. Is it a big deal? We can demonstrate the economic potential of the mineral systems by using Geoscience Australia's economic fairway tool. The map on the right shows a model of economic viability, assuming a deposit with 50 million tons of ore body containing 0.8% copper and 0.5 gram per ton gold. The deposit parameters are a realistic assumption, as the 50 million ton ore body is only around 50% of the total mineral resource estimate of some proven mineral systems in the region. For example, the Thirsty Scotsen deposit in the west of Victoria. The model results suggest that such a discovery would be economically viable for, wet, for the white part of the Dalamarine origin margin, shows in the red colors on the map. Therefore, our studies across the Dalamarine margin of mainland Australia has made it go from an exploration black hole to exploration opportunities. This slide summarizes the datasets from our project. If you need any further details, please scan the QR code provided here or contact me directly. I would like to take this opportunity to thank many of our friends, collaborators, and partner organizations. Because of limited space, I do apologize as I can't list them all here. I appreciate your help and support 
during the journey over the past few years. I thoroughly enjoyed the collaborations and I'm looking forward to more in the future. Thank you for listening. Gambo, yes, it is a big deal. Thank you for summarising the implications of the work that you, David and Chris have presented on the mineral system potential of the region. This brings us to the question and answer session. Our presenters are here in the studio, ready to answer your questions on their talks. So please add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter that you'd like to ask. To kick things off, I've got some questions for all the presenters. So team, given what we know about the Delamerian, in your view, what are the key remaining big questions to progress our understanding of the resource potential across the region? And I might start with you, Chris. Thank you, Marina. Um, we've only really just started scratching the surface. Even though um, we've just demonstrated a whole new wealth of scientific knowledge across the Delamerian, um, we're really just literally scraping the surface and um, as you can see that there are some still remain some holes on those maps that you've seen both from uh, a crustal architecture point of view from geochronology and isotopes to all the way down to mineral systems um, look I'll, I'd probably say that there's too many to list but I think we should have a conversation as a, as a panel about what, what those could be David uh, I think there's a few uh, the one that I've been thinking about quite a lot as the project's gone on is whether there could be how the origin and the arc evolved over time. So we've established that there's quite a wide back arc in the south that transitions to be more narrow up north. And part of Holly Taylor's geochemistry shows that there are arc rocks in a lot of the cars on the western margin and also on the eastern margin with back arc in the middle. So it begs the question, how did this origin progress was there a arc against the Gorda Craton which then then the arc rolled back and then formed another arc leaving a remnant arc behind or did the back arc open and there was only one arc now it's hard to tell that but it's massively important because are there two arcs to search for mm. or one mm. that's basically doubling our search space so if we we've just started to get the data where we're starting to see that may, might be there and the question is now to take that further and try and establish that. And there are counter arguments that the back arc opened even before the arc formed. And Stacey Curse has shown that in her work and has really nice evidence for that. So, and John Foden, the opposite model. So this, there's lots of great data, lots of great models out there, but that could be really important for understanding mineral systems and search spaces. Thanks very much. I can't agree more, Chris and, uh, and David. Um, See, so, um, I think over the past few years, we have uh, collected a massive amount of uh, data sets from different perspectives, and we have made some substantial uh, progress in terms of understanding the geological background, the geological framework, as well as the architecture and the mineral, system, mineral systems and the mineral potential. But remember, Dalamari is such a massive country. It's like around 2,000 kilometers long and, uh, and, and three, three, 300 kilometers wide. So it's a massive land and it's, I mean, its size is even I mean, similar or even larger than many countries. So I, I believe there are still a lot of work to do, not only for us, probably for the whole community. Um, I have, um, say, economic geology background, so I'm thinking of some remaining uh, big questions for, for, for mineral systems as well as, as well. As, for, for mineral potentials. So the, the first question for me, um, uh, from the mineral system or mineral potential perspective, I think um, it's about uh, cr critical minerals or strategic resources. Mm -hmm. Say so we have got some uh, understandings on the, on the types of mineral systems, their formation um, age, as well as the uh, tectonic background for the formation of the mineral systems. But what about the, the potential for, for critical minerals? For example, cobalt, lithium, tin tungsten, as mentioned by mm -hmm. David. So that's something um, I'm hoping to know more in the future. So the other question to me is about the unspecified or unclassified, uh, unclassified mineral systems. So we um, we have known some, let's say, uh, uh, known, so, known some information about about the about the types of, of certain mineral systems, but there are still some unclassified mineral systems. So what about them? In the next, so I would also um, hope to to do a bit 
a bit of more work on them in the, in the next to 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 specify their the types of of the metal genesis and the and the manual systems for for, for these unclassified uh, deposits or systems. Thank you, panel. Uh, good morning, Richard. Richard Blewett, thank you for your question. Uh, great series of deep dive presentations. Richard says, the interpreted Z-shaped 515 million year old arc makes sense. Looking at the potential fields, we see the northwest to southeast to northeast southwest to the northwest southeast step changes probably reflecting in rift axis and transfer as shown by Chris. However, David showed some really interesting map patterns in the various isotope systems that don't really mimic those simple potential field patterns. How do you reconcile those differences and what would those mean for the mineral systems potential and feasibility? You want to take the first hit as, uh, from the Yeah, last sure. Topics? So I think that the potential fields are looking at the crustal architecture as they are now. Mm. Um, so that's one way I look at it. And the isotopic data looks at it in the past. So we're, we're potentially seeing complexity within the crustal architecture that is mapped by the potential fields. So I would say that they can, they go together, essentially. Um, that would be my first, my first thought. Mm. Is there a resolution um, element as well? I guess just sort of looking at yeah. the potential field data, we're, we're, we're really taking point data within the geochrom space almost mm. and then trying to map that, you know, yeah. you're taking a zircon trying to represent, you know, a fifth of the country. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's, yeah. A, that's a, always a problem with isotopic mapping in a way that you are limited by what rock you can get and obviously in covered areas. The fact that we made the maps the way we did, I was pretty happy with the result, yeah. to be honest. But um, yeah, there's... There is that aspect of that the geophysical data is more high resolution, if you will, mm. and so it's always important to remember that when using um, isotopic maps and comparing them with other systems, for sure. But I think that if you take, if you look at Stavely, for example, even just the mag magnetics in Stavely, there's a long trend there which is interpreted as a Stavely um, system, basically um, Mount Stavely volcanic complex, mm -hmm. and even within that we have found at least initially different s signatures in the isotopic data. So it's within some of these geophysical features, there's subtle geological and geochemical features that, um, yeah, that are, it's more complex than it can look at first glance. Yeah, no one, no one tool in the toolkit's gonna answer the questions for us. And it's the, the integration of, of the, the variety of, of data that we have available to us that helps answer the questions or poses more. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's like there's no silver bullet for for manual manual exploration in the real world. So for us, we we collect different data sets, and ho hopefully we can see some pattern from different per perspective of, of 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 the implications of the data sets, and then that can help us to to understand the the framework and also the geological evolution history of of, of the region. I mean, um, I think it's it's natural. Uh, to see some different patterns in um, in different, for example, as topic systems as well as some geophysical and geological um, uh, observations, because say from north to south, um, they actually they they do belong to different tectonic regime or different te te tectonic setting, and of course they they do have different potential for different types of mineral systems. For example, on the northern side, because it's more close to the, uh, for example, the Kronomana uh, block, so it's more like a uh, continental arc setting. And then to the southern side, um, um, it's, it's more have like an island arc uh, affinity for, for many of the samples. And say, for different tectonic settings, they do have different potentials for, for different manner systems because different, different input from, from different geological co component that can lead to the formation of different types of manner systems um, at different geological evolution stages. So, so my suggestion is that, so for explorers in different parts of the Dalamari, you focus on different types of uh, mineral systems. Say, as, as shown in, in my talk, um, um, there are some different alteration um, uh, patterns for different types of mineral systems. So that can be something useful 
uh, for explorers uh, during their exploration activities that can give people some ideas about what kind of manual systems they are dealing with. Then that can probably de develop uh, uh, like an exploration strategy to move forward. I think in many cases, in many, many isotopic maps, you see things that cross court with mag or gravity and some people some i've had comments where like how does that work it, it can't possibly work but it's there's a time component in the isotopic yeah. systems which is really important to constrain and it can the differences can be really the most important thing in this those differences between geophysics and the isotopes yeah. as well even though they may look weird at first glance so it's a really good point and it's something that is probably worth looking at closer yeah stay tuned more more to say here so this one's from for Yambo from John G. G'day. Uh, great talk, Yambo, and I absolutely agree with that. Uh, what do you think the geodynamic setting is for the De De Devonian magmatic magne mag metallogenic <laughs> event, and what are the mineral systems to explore for? Hello, John. Thanks very much for the for the for the question. Um, very interesting question. Um, Say for the Devonian uh, uh, manual systems, actually there are, um, as shown by uh, David, uh, David in, his, in his talk, um, there are Silurian ages and Devonian ages uh, for magmatic systems. Uh, for for manual system for for manual relation, we have got some uh, quite some uh, Devonian age um, uh, for for different types of manual systems from from different alteration manuals. So that can definitely give us some very clear implication about the timing of the of the of the manual system I and mean, the formation of the uh, of the manual systems they are devolving and uh, this is something new um, um, I mean this is a new funding from our project so people have some let's say some clues or some some sniffs about uh, about the ex existence of of this kind of systems but for our project it we confirmed we conf we confirmed this so they there are uh, Devonian manual systems or ma magmatic metallogenic events across the whole Delamere, from 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 uh, Loch Leda Cars um, to, um, to to South Australia Delamere, uh, as well as to the west western of Victoria. So it's it's not uh, just a random single uh, deposit. Actually, it's a regional uh, metallogenic metallogenic events. As for the geodynamic setting, it's a very good question. Say. Uh, we because this is new. See, we haven't uh, uh, we haven't got a very clear conclusion about about the exact uh, geodynamic setting for this. But there are some clues for this because we can get some. That's the con con we can have some com comparison between the uh, what happened in 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 the Delamarine um, margin and the and the and the uh, Lachland. There are some like. Uh, basin formation events in 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 in, in Lachland origin or Auckland uh, uh, belt. So, which means it's an extensional setting. Um, this is very consistent with with what we have seen um, uh, from the Devonian uh, metallogenic events and the and the all systems because they are they all formed uh, associated with certain uh, like extensional events. Uh, from different scales, from manual scale, from deposit scale, even from the regional scale. So. I, I would say it's more like an uh, extensional um, setting for, for the Devonian uh, metallogenic events in Delamarine. And as for what, I mean, so what are the manual systems to be explored for, um, I think it's, it's a bit similar to, to what happened in, well, I can't, th there are some similarities, but also some substantial differences between the Devonian metallogenic events and the Cambrian uh, manual system events. So as for devoning, I think um, there are good potentials for some still magmatic hydrothermal manual systems, including uh, porphyry, ibisomal, and um, um, even some like uh, insulin related gold systems and uh, scarn uh, deposits in different parts of uh, of of, um, of um, uh, Delamere. For example, the star wall in um, in uh, in Western Victoria, it's it's well. It's, it's still under discussion, but uh, from the data we have got so far, it looks like insulin-related insulin -related gold uh, mineral system. So there is actually a spectrum of different types of mineral systems are formed in, in, in Devonian across the whole Delamarine. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Jimbo. Thanks, John. 
uh, and for everybody from Mrs Anonymous. If you follow the Lot Lily Cars Belt south, you end up in the Glenelg zone. Could the Staverley zone be a stranded arc segment? I'll, I'll take a, hint, uh, a stab at this one, Marina, if I may. Um, one, of the, one of the earlier questions is, well, what are some of the science questions that still still remain in this project area? And in, in the um, geological framework talk at the start of this session, we, we showed that we were only focusing on a small part of the Loch Lily Cars Belt. We haven't really followed that all the way through into South Australia and down around into, into the Glenelg zone. So um, really, we're not sure is, is, is where we currently are at, the, at this point in time. We are, we are looking quite um, under quite a, a, a thick cover of Murray Basin sediments there, and, and it might be something for us to, to look into. Um, uh, in the Glenelg zone, um, the Glenelg zone itself generally shows rocks of, of higher metamorphic grade than, than what we see farther north, so as, um, as we progress up into what is the Loch Lily Cars Belt. Um, it's sort of more, more of the green schist facies, but it is a higher grade down in the Glenelg zone and, and potentially we're looking at that sort of hyperextended margin there. Um, could it be a stranded arc segment? Could we be looking at a, a ripped apart um, arc where, where another part of that, that original arc is farther to the west within South Australia or as Dave suggested in... Um, um, I'm not sure if it was in your talk or in a conversation that we've had. <laughs> um, are we looking at two different? Um, are, are there two arcs that that, that formed in, in quick succession? Um, could be, yeah, yeah. I guess the short answer is, yeah, it could, it could be. Um, yeah, there's, there's Stevie has been bugging me to be honest <laughs> because it's it, chemically it's so different. The, the, when you say stranded arc segment, I guess I wonder whether you meant exotic, whether it could be kind of an accreted island arc essentially just something that is totally different but we've discussed that internally and when we look at the seismic you see generally pretty good con continuation of stavely like intrusions and stuff into the more northern parts of the origin so it seems like and looking at the geochronology it's been placed into the um, Glen Thompson sandstone which has very similar to trial to like, geochronology to the um Kaman 2 group and other sediments we associate so it looks like it's on that same margin that same edge of the of East Gondwana so it's we're thinking at the moment that it's something to do with the actual crustal architecture that it's so it's just that bit that's further away possibly from the craton that it hasn't got a South Australian craton um, component to it which meant that it didn't have the mag the old magma didn't have to go through the old craton so that's an that's a, an option, <laughs> but again, like a dismembered arc is something that could happen. But the question is, where's the rest of the arc it was dismembered from? Mm. If we saw other parts of the arc that were like Stavely, then potentially. But it really is quite unique. Even the Mount Reed area in Tasmania, which I guess is may not be part of the Denimere at all, but that doesn't look like it either. And that's obviously highly mineralized. There are some intrusions in New Zealand of similar age that do show similar features. Um, so potentially it's something more, a really big scale feature that's something along the whole subduction zone there that some parts of it are affected by um, a process that may be slab related, for example, or something. So yeah, it's, it's a really good question. It's definitely one that we are actively trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in your presentation, Dave, you, sh we show, you showed how the Stavely, Stavely Arc, where it's exposed, does go beneath cover. And then you had another, you had another sample um, but that was of what that, that, that mm. magmatic extension is north, and it shows yeah. quite different. So yeah. where where do, where is that transition and, and what is the nature of that transition yeah. from the, the juvenile mm. nature of Stavely into the, the rest of the arc mm. rocks? Yeah. yeah, it'd be really nice to just drill a lot of that Mount <laughs> Stavely <laughs> and just figure out what, what was going on there because it's super interesting. But yeah. it has been done. You were involved in that as well. Yeah. And it's yeah. They're hard to get zircons from. And there's yeah. A, yeah, it's quite it's reasonably well covered there as well but it's yeah there is a lot of potential i think because at least from a fertility point of view a lot of the indicators we use are pretty good for mm. copper porphyry i think and there obviously mm. is some porphyry mineralization there so yeah it's an important one to figure out yeah it's 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 really interesting to have a comparison between between the stable room and uh, and the uh, uh, local cars in terms of uh, their potentials for different mineral systems um say so i think there are many similarities uh, in terms of uh, 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 
the manual system types in both areas. For example, in, in stability zone, there are quite some, say, porphyry epsomal, so some proven uh, porphyry systems, um, quite well known already. But in local cars, although we haven't made significant discoveries on, on for example, on porphyry or epsomal systems, but um, based on the data we have collected in our project, I think there are good potentials uh, for, 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 for porphyry or epithermal systems in local class as well. But as uh, mentioned by Chris and, and David, there are some substantial difference, um, fundamental difference uh, between, between local class and, uh, and uh, Stably. Um, if, we, if we, let's say, um, take a step back and look at the big picture, um, actually Stably is not only different from local class, but also quite different from the Glenelg. Uh, Glenelg room in I mean also in in Western worlds to South Australia, for for the manual systems in Stably as as mentioned there are porphyry epithermal systems so it's a classic um, say uh, porphyry epithermal system room or cluster, but uh, just uh, Western worlds um, there are uh, let's say for example Kaman two some big systems like Kaman two and uh, another deposit called uh, Angas which is in the southwest of uh, uh, southeast of uh, um, of of Kamantu. these two manual systems are quite different from the manual systems in in Stively actually. So for Stively, um, clearly it's porphyry epsomal, so a lot of uh, very classic uh, characteristics of, of the systems. But for for Kamantu and Angas, uh, it's more like an it's more more complex system, co more complicated system with a lot of overprintings from different geological events. These features people haven't seen a lot in the stable room. So mm -hmm. there are some st substantial differences uh, from the perspective of manual systems between locked cars, uh, Glenac room, and as well as stable room. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for Chris Oyambo um, from Richard Blowett, have you looked at that OSIEM data for basement conductors that may reflect non-stratigraphic, non that is alteration, mineralization, anomalism? More specifically, did the drilling provide constraints for the interpretation of the OSIEM lines? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. Um, so. In the, in the presentation that we showed, we, we did show the Oz AEM and the, and, the, and the broader AEM coverage and, and how that was used to interpret the cover um, largely over the, the buried arc rocks within, within the Delamarian. What, what the, um, the AEM has largely shown is the Murray sequences. So um, particularly where, where there is um, more conductive features within that AEM data, we're unable to penetrate through through the Murray Basin to see the nature of um, the the arc rocks. So it's it's alteration, mineralization um, anomalies there. Um, however, where where the base where where um, the cover shallows or, or thins at the basin edges, and we start to get those arc rocks, um, I'm not sure if we've actually looked at that yet, um, but something to consider. Um, one of the other pieces of work that we're still really excited to, to have the opportunity to look into is um, lo looking at and, and doing a more detailed interpretation of the AEM infill. So not just the, the, a, the Oz AEM line space data, but the infill that was undertaken as part of the Exploring for the Future program. And we hope that you know getting, in, getting our teeth stuck into that one and having a look at those data will provide that higher resolution um, and interpretation that, that may answer some of those questions. Um, as to drilling providing constraints on the interpretation of the Oz AEM lines, um, I'll, be, I'll be fairly candid. We, we applied uh, the interpretation of the Oz AEM before we did the drilling. And so one of the next steps is to then have that positive feedback loop where we've, uh, we've taken the drilling results, we know where the, the cover sequences are and the, and the basement rocks are, and feed that into those um, Oz AEM interpretations, but also the cover models. So, um, you know, developing those cover models, looking at the... Um, um, uh, it's the eggs database, and I apologise because it doesn't come to me right now as to what the what that acronym stands for. <laughs> um, looking to see how where those um, those basement tops or those or those magnetic tops are um, to inform future uh, models that we may may develop. So, in summary, 
Um, no, the drilling didn't provide constraints on the interpretation of Oz AMM, but we're going to take that next step and put that positive feedback loop in um, in the future. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Um, and for all from Way Home, thank you to the three speakers for the deep dive talks and for collecting many impressive new data. Do you think it is necessary to break down the Delamarian metallogeny from 590 to about 400 MA in different periods? Delamarian origin was defined in time roughly from 520 MA to 490 MA. There is an obvious gap between the Neoproterozoic and Cambrian. The Devonian system seemed to relate to the Lachlan or originy. Okay, let me uh, give a crack on this one. Uh, thanks um, um, uh, very much for, for this question. It's very to the point. I, I can't agree more that um, it's definitely it's very necessary to break down the Delamarine metal journey from, I mean, from, from, say, around 600 to around 400 million years. Say, and that's actually, it, it, it's what we, we, we did because the, these mineral systems all formed at different ages associated with different tectonic events. For example, for the for the 600, 490, I mean 590, 580 events, they are more associated with the breakup of the Rodinia. So it's like a passive margin, a passive rifting um, margin setting. So um, it's 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 definitely before the uh, Dalmarine subduction or Dalmarine or organic events. Um, we 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 call it um, Dalmarine cycle instead of uh, Dalmarine. Um, uh, origin or subduction because the, the cycle can cover way longer uh, geological history, basically from 500, uh, no, 830 million years to around um, um, 590, uh, say 495 million years. So, um, but for the Delamarine cycle, we can break it down to different pieces. So, say the passive margin uh, stage, which is before. Um, uh, 530, 520 million years, and from from five, 520 uh, million years old, that's the initiation of the Dalmarian subduction. So the sub that that stage continues um, until around five, 505 million years, which is the start of the uh, Dalmarian origin stage, and then that stage continues uh, around say 10 million years and then, um, ended at around 500, uh, 495 million years. So after 495 million years, that's the post Dalmarine orogenic stage, uh, which is the uh, stage for the formation of, of, of the uh, porphyry copper moly gold systems in South Australia. Uh, that stage, uh, that's the benumbering origin. Um, um, it's in, uh, in, 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 in many let, 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 literatures. And then after the benum benumbering uh, origin, that goes to that's I mean that stage un un ended at around 440 million years, and then that after that it that that got into another uh, cycle called Tabernburn, uh stage, and um, I believe the magmatic hydrosmos uh, mineral systems formed uh, between say 412 million years to uh, 400 million years around. That's that's that's. Um, that's that's a response for for the for the evolution of the Tabarabaran uh, cycle. That's another or origin. So all the mineral systems are formed um, associated with different um, um, tectonic events. So that's why we think it's 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 necessary to break them down into different stages across the uh, around two hundred million years geological history. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Nabo yeah, said. It's I get the question, it's kind of like, is it really Delamarian if it happened at 490? But as, as Yambo said, there's, there's been this definition of the cycle. So you, we start off in a rift phase at the beginning of the Delamarian cycle. The Delamarian origin is the spatial area. So that's why we get a, a bit, it, we just struggle with this a lot. We have a lot of conversations about what shall we call things. The, there's an arc phase, which is 520 to 505, 490, you know, 500, depending on what ages you, you look at, what part of the arc you look at. Um, that's the dead oh, the, or, the actual orogeny doesn't happen until 505, 495. So yes. it's kind of like how, what, what do you really call Delamarian mineralization? If it's in, we took the approach, I think, generally, that if it's, we're looking at the origin itself, if there's something happening in the origin, the Delamarian origin spatially, then it's a Delamarian metallogenic 
problem and that's what we address so but I understand the question and that's just it's probably important for us to communicate that that's how we how we did it yeah yes thank you so another one from Wei Hong again and more from you David do you have um other evidence to support tin tungsten mineralisation potential in the Delamarian margin based on your Zircon Petro chronology study? The short answer is no. <laughs> the, 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 what I showed was basically a correlation between known systems from granite chemistry and how those systems translate to Zircon and then how the systems then will translate onto the map. So there's it's not so much making a direct comparison like is there definitely tungsten here it's more about how could we use this fundamental scientific approach to be predictive mm. but it would be really nice if in one of those areas i showed there was a tin tungsten deposit but there isn't right now as far as i'm aware anyway um so yeah you, it isn't actually ground truth by an actual deposit it's just really based on the fundamental relationships we expect to see in that mineral system and isotopic data and geochemistry etc I definitely second uh, what David just mentioned. So, see the fertility um, 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 results from the zircon chemistry is more like a relative concept. So there are uh, uh, some, let's say, smells or sniffs for for the formation of uh, uh, tin tungsten uh, mineral lithium, but does not necessarily mean there are uh, tin tungsten deposits in that part of the world. Um, say. See, Dalmar is uh, such a massive uh, uh, country, and uh, there's so much to be done in the, in the next. So based on what we, ha we have found so far, it's, it's more like a um, convergent margin uh, um, with uh, different uh, types of, uh, of arc system. And that's where people always means, can find uh, porphyry, abysmal uh, types of mineral systems, the, the high oxidation um, uh, state uh, mineral systems. But for, for tin tungsten systems, they are more reduced and they are more associated with, let's say, the back arc ext extension setting. So, um, but in Delamarine, we do have that kind of tectonic uh, setting or regime, but it's more in the back arc side. So it's more close to the, um, uh, in, it's, it's, it's more, let's say, you know, on the western side of the Delamarine arc instead of the eastern side. Thank you, David and Yambo. Unfortunately, we'll have to draw the Q&A session to a close now. So thank you, Chris, David, Yambo. Awesome talks, fantastic panel. And thank you to everybody who attended today's session, particularly if you asked a question. Um, if you'd still like to ask more questions or make contact, please email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. The showcase will continue in an hour at one o'clock with our next session on deep dives into the Burundudu, West Musgrave and South Nicholson, Georgina regions. Remember that the link for this session is the same as the link for the next session. If you missed anything from today's session or if you'd like to re-watch something, the recordings are just about available and they will be in the coming days on our showcase webpage, ga.gov.au forward slash showcase. We look forward to seeing you shortly. <laughs>